I don't agree with every word. I never agree with anyone on everything. But he said some very important starting points, which we should never forget when we get to the details. One thing he started with is he likes Greta Thunberg. <laughs> okay? And I like her too. We should oh, show good. her. Picture. Yay. Okay? Greta did not say, spend more money on us climate researchers. That's not what she said. She didn't say, sea level rise is coming, at least not exactly. She said, the human species is in danger of extinction. I'm not here to defend a political party. I'm here because I want to be alive. And I want our children to be alive. And it is so serious, it is a matter of life and death. And it is. She also said, you adults have not been rational. You have many words. You have so many empty words about your glorious positions on climate change. But you do not have a serious, workable, technically, economically valid solution for how to solve these problems. Mark recently complained about climate policies, which are 40% efficient. I have studied these policies. I have gone all the way to the practical level of actual devices and systems. The policies people are advocating today I would say are more like 1% efficient. If you decide you care about climate change and you want to spend a trillion dollars and you reduce the damage by one billion dollars, you should not be proud. We need climate policies which are efficient, which get maximum real value for minimum cost. And when I look at the policies people are working on today, they are very far from technical efficiency. So today I want to talk about two major themes. How bad is the worst case climate change? Is it as bad as Greta says? Are we looking at the possibility that all humans on Earth might die? Most people who hear Greta think, oh, she's imagining it. She just means we'll lose some money. No, it is not imaginary. There is solid scientific evidence that the survival of the human species is at risk. That does not mean we know the probability, but it is at risk. But you won't find the evidence from her. If you listen closely, you will hear some of the evidence from me. It would take many hours to discuss all the evidence why our lives are at risk. But I will give you websites and links. The evidence is there if you care about living or dying. I will speak about that briefly. But the big question is what can we do about it? There are people who say we cannot solve the problem. They look at these big climate bills. They say this will cost too much money it will not solve the problem. <coughs> and those big climate bills would cost too much money, and they would not solve the problem. But there is a rational way forward. And if I have time, I will try to discuss how we could solve these problems and maybe make a profit. It need not cost money. The one ingredient we are missing, we need to use our intelligence and be flexible. We need to connect the best advanced technology in a rational way with the problem. And that's a quick summary. So my first slide is about something called the precautionary principle. I should say a little bit about uh, who I am. I work for the National Science Foundation, judging, evaluating advanced research in many areas for about 30 years. And before that, for 10 years, I developed the big energy forecasting models used by the Department of Energy. I was the person who wrote the computer code to predict future energy use. That was a great learning experience. Um, 
And in the course of all that, in the year 2009, we had a new president, Obama. Obama made two promises to the American people. He said, the two things I want to accomplish most, one, I want to fix health care, and two, I want to reduce greenhouse gases by 80%. These are the two things Obama was committed to. And so a bill was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives to meet Obama's ideas. And then it went to the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate made the final decision, will we have a climate bill or not? It was run by a committee called Environment and Public Works Committee, EPW, of the Senate. I was the scientist sent from the National Science Foundation to observe, evaluate, and help in that activity. I saw the law, I saw it being produced, and I saw why the process failed. The bill which came out of the committee was too expensive and ineffective, but we can do better. We could do better if we change our thinking, and we must change our thinking. In that year, maybe the most rational speech I heard on climate change came from John Kirk. He was a Democrat candidate for president. He was also chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I heard him in a year talk about the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is, you know, he asked the question, would it be worth a trillion dollars a year to deeply reduce a 25% probability, a worst case damage, which could make humanity extinct? Curry said we shouldn't ask what is going to happen, we don't know. But if we have bad luck, how bad could it be? Can we spend money? to get rid of the risk that we all die. The precautionary principle is, if you are facing a risk that could possibly kill everybody, you should be willing to spend money now to try to eliminate or reduce that risk. That's what I want to talk about. This is a beautiful cartoon from a biology course in Australia. If you look at this website, you'll see the rest of the biology course. You'll see two little turtles. And one turtle says, we should get you sh we should not get out until you can prove that we won't be boiled alive. People talk like this about climate change. They say it's not proven we will die yet. We don't know if it will kill us or not. We're, we're not sure, we're not certain. Let's wait until we're certain. When are you certain? You are certain when you are dead. If we are rational, we will not wait until we are certain that we are dead. So we need to find out what can we do? How big is the risk? So I have many slides about the risk, and I have many slides how we can avoid the risk if we use our brains. So now let me jump to the next slide. Okay. So I will have to be very quick on the damage. But there is some good news. You have copies of these slides, I understand. I hope you do, at least on the web. Um, I gave a one-hour interview recently on YouTube about the nature of the risk, why we might all die. I will speak briefly about it. But if you go to YouTube and search on Wervos Eucinia, you can get a full hour. I will have to cut out important information now. I want to jump to solutions. Um, in the year 2009, the Senate held hearings about science and climate change. The Republicans had the best skeptical witnesses, the Democrats the most active witnesses. And I still remember, by the way, I was in the room, this is a picture of the actual Senate hearing, and I was one of the people sitting behind on the top row. Um, one of the Republican witnesses said, you are so silly to worry about 500 parts per million. In most of the history of the Earth, 
Carbon dioxide was more than 2,000 parts per million. Didn't life just go on as usual? How bad could it be? And when he asked that question, nobody in the Senate knew the answer to it. I didn't know. Nobody else knew. And he said, if life goes on as usual, how bad could it be? And then that year, I heard an answer. In 2009, the director of geosciences of the National Science Foundation introduced a big public talk to introduce a person called Peter Ward. And he told us, Peter Ward, this is not like the fake news experts you watch on TV. This is the real expert. Peter Ward passed scientific review. He was the person who learned what really happened in the mass death of the past. There have been many times in the past history of the Earth when billions of creatures died. Life did not just go on as usual in the past. There were incidents of mass death, but the question is what happened? And Peter Ward went out with a hammer and a chisel, climbing through the jungle, looking through the geological evidence, <coughs> doing measurements to find out what happened. When I heard his talk, he mostly just talked about the past history of the Earth. What did happen in the Earth for the past billion years? And at the end of this talk, he said very briefly, and by the way, you see these curves. I've been watching this data. And I look at the data now, and it looks very familiar to me. The data now looks like the data I saw for the period of mass death in the past. Based on my experience with the history, my feeling is that if the parts per million reach a thousand, probably we will all die. That upset me. That worried me. It changed my life. I I went out of that room thinking, is he right or is he wrong? I don't know. I'm a scientist. I don't just believe people. I want to find out, is it true or is it not? But what shocked me the most was what the rest of the audience did. Half the people in the audience said, oh, this is just climate stuff. Climate stuff is not true. Wait a minute. This is history. This is data. This is real. But the other half said, at the end of this talk, what I have learned is that I am a good person. I support climate change. So I can go out of the room happy that I am a good person. My God, that is not the message. If all we think about is, I am a good person, I support climate change, if we're all going to die, that doesn't help us much. Is there a problem? What causes the problem? How can we stop it? And I spent many years, I studied his book. I only had to spend like $3 to buy his book from Amazon. I had to buy a couple of other books he wrote just to make the free shipping. Um, and I studied his book, I studied the footnotes. I do not agree with everything he says, but he gives good sources. And now I think I know what the problem was even better than he did. But let me show you his data. <laughs> Basically, carbon dioxide has gone up for over many millions of years. And if you look at the four big extinctions, I need to move this out here. Um, all the big extinctions of life came at a point of maximum carbon dioxide. And what Peter Ward said is, it's not how high the carbon dioxide is, it's the speed of increase. And by the way, it is experiencing a fast speed of increase now. So the question is, is it going to happen? Will we all die? Um, I disagree with this theory, but it's clear what happened with this H2S explosion, this poison coming up from the ocean. What causes this poison, H2S, to come up from the ocean is a combination of low oxygen and fertilizer in the ocean. I think that's the real cause. If you go to my website, you'll see more about the details. We have current data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency. And this basically shows that the oxygen levels around the Pacific 
are declining at a rate of what, 81 per year. And if you look at the actual thickness, it looks like 40 years. If you look at the present rate at which the oxygen is thinning, we have data from NOAA showing the oxygen layers are thinning. The, the layers which bring oxygen to the Pacific Ocean is getting thinner. We've measured it. And at the current rate, we have 40 years before the oxygen goes to zero. We have lots of fertilizer in the ocean. Crude first gas is okay. In 40 years, the poison starts to come. And anybody who lives around the Pacific Rim starts to die, die. It's about 40 years and it continues in the present. Now, but will it keep reducing? We don't know. There are uncertainties. There are things which no one knows. I've tried to study this to find out how soon will we all start to die? And what do we have to do to prevent it from happening? Um, and since I have limited time, I won't go into that. You can go to the website and I'll discuss the details. Um, there's good news, but there's also bad news. Um, but I'd like to talk about what can we do to solve it. A lot of people say, okay, we care about carbon dioxide. We're good economists, just put a price of carbon dioxide and the market will be efficient and we'll solve the problem. That turns out to be grossly incorrect because the markets for electricity and transportation are not classic popular models. Um, so, well, I'm, I, I, let me mention briefly, 80% of the carbon dioxide emissions from the U.S. really come from two sources. There's electricity generation and there's highway vehicles. That's what Ban Ki-moon was talking about. Let's fix the electric sector, let's fix the cars. And let's not make it theoretical, let's make it actually work. When the Obama bill died, many experts in climate change said, we made a mistake to propose a grand bill for everything, like the Kyoto action worked in Europe. It passed, but it didn't solve the problem. It was a mistake to try to pass one bill that did everything with one carbon tax or one cap and trade. It doesn't work in the real world. A lot of why it doesn't work is that electric utilities and cars have special needs. So what I'm going to propose is a five-point plan. If anything survives here, please, this is the important slide. You have not seen it, but the pieces are all there, but nobody is doing it. Five-point plan. A sec what they call a sectoral bill to cut the net greenhouse gas generation in electricity generation. Same thing with cars and trucks. These are the two things which Ban Ki-moon rightly gave priority to. But we have to do it right. We have to do it intelligently. We can't just use a sledgehammer. We need to pay attention to the technical realities of electricity and cars. But there are three other points which are also critical. In agriculture, you heard about cows. A lot of people say, don't eat meat anymore. A jury has a friend. Avery Lovins family. And they are so mad that people say, don't eat meat. They say, don't you know about cows? And he was right. I argued with him. He was right. Jerry's friend was right. Do you know that cows sequester a huge amount of carbon in the soil through solid emission? Okay. Uh, you, you understand why congressmen don't like to talk so much about the solid matter output of cows. But in fact, this is an important part of the cycle. And better agricultural practices could help tremendously in sequestering carbon dioxide and reducing emissions. Good treatment, rational treatment of cows. So better agricultural legislation, and we also need geoengineering, and we need research. Each one of these is a one-hour topic. I apologize, I won't have time to do it now. Electricity is one that I know especially well because uh, I, I'm on the IEEE Energy Policy Committee. How many of you know what IEEE is? 
Well, I'm glad there are a few. IEEE is the world's largest engineering technical society. It's totally international. Um, the president of IEEE must win election in a hundred countries around the world, certainly Korea and Japan. In fact, the president of IEEE today is a Japanese guy who's a friend of mine. I visited him last week, and he is worried about these problems. So the bottom line is, IEEE knows about electricity and the real world of electricity. And they commissioned me to do a paper which you can find on the web, which gives you the technical details. I cannot prove in half an hour everything I say about electricity. But if you go to this website, it has the evidence and it has the links and it says exactly what we need to do to reduce greenhouse gases and electricity. Shutting down coal plants is one small part of it. We need a comprehensive approach to really minimize greenhouse gases and electricity, and this website describes how to do it. It's, it and by the way, this was reviewed at many levels of IEEE. So the top electric utilities have looked at this strategy for how to reduce greenhouse gases and electricity. We need that. Solar energy is part of it. What we need most to improve solar energy in half the world is we need more wires. Because solar energy in good locations already can compete with other sources. But you have to put it in good locations. So you need to build wires. And you need to change the law so that you can build the wires. And the biggest problem with renewable energy in the United States is we have laws which prevent building the wires. If you want to bring solar energy from Texas to the East Coast, the law stops you. Oil people have changed the law. But if we fix the law, solar energy is already cheap enough. And we have plenty. We need to change the law to permit it. OK. Uh, I was in charge of the research in that area. Am I over time? There's a, a clock down here. That's, the minus means it should over the time. OK. So electricity, <laughs> we can do it with cars. There's a bill. Let me just show one sign. On this website is a legislation that Senator Specter wanted to introduce, which would dramatically reduce greenhouse emissions in the automotive sector and enhance national security. If you go to this website, you will see the bill Senator Specter wanted to introduce, and you'll see supporting material. It can be done around the world, and I'm mad at Senator Reid that he wanted to do Obama stuff first, and he just lost it. Okay, so um, I guess I'm over time. This is a complicated issue. We have to get the technical details right, and, uh, and we do need more research. Thank you for your patience.